Hello, I'm Mokhar Rizvi, and this is Scope. We're going to start off today's show by discussing France, and we've discussed Islamophobia in that country for a while now, specifically when it comes to government policies and cause and effect when you have a government and officials who use anti-Islam, anti-Muslim rhetoric that then does cause, of course, real-world consequences for Muslims on the ground. And we've had now news of a number of mosques in France that have been attacked over the past number of months, and just the most late readest is out of the French city of of Bordeaux, um, where a mosque was defaced with Islamophobic graffiti. Um, again, this is no surprise, because if the government is heading this way, then certainly society will head this way as well, and Muslims will then feel the brunt of that sort of uh, hateful rhetoric that the government has been espousing and propagating. Let's discuss that a bit further. We're now joined by Abdel Noor Toumi, who is a North Africa expert at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. He's joining us today from Paris. Abdel Noor, thank you for your time today. Um, what do you make of this latest incident? I mean. Um, Islamophobic graffiti in and of itself is not the worst that it could be, but I know that there have been attacks against Muslims more directly as well. No, no, thank you for having me. Uh, actually, as you stated in your uh, opening statement of the show, this, uh, let's say, policy or kind of rhetoric but also is getting very, very uh, serious about the relation between Muslims, French, especially French uh, Muslims, and the uh, rest of the uh, French society, knowing that the, the French people, basically, they have been dealing with Islam for, I'd say, not decades, but for centuries. And this goes back in the early 19th century with the invasion and then the occupation of Algeria for 130 years. And then with all the, uh, again, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, we can, to, 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 to link this historical uh, trajectory about what what has uh, has been going on lately on the uh, Macron's uh, let's say Islam policy or he wants it uh, to uh, domesticate the, the Muslim because they are using the sacrosanct term of the laicity or like we call it in the Anglo-Saxon societies, uh, secularism, which is totally different than the concept of the Franco-French terminology of laicity. So this has been, again, uh, going on for the last, let's say, 10, 15 years. But the roots of this, I'm not going to I mean, keep lecturing the, the audience about the, this yeah. historical event, but the, the, the key or the shift in policy of the, of the France politicians and elite dealing with Islam, it started in 1989. That was in the first time when the two sisters with uh, who showed up to their junior high with a headscarf. So yeah. the entire story started from there. But it's very, I think, important element here to, to, to mention how the uh, French politicians, mm -hmm. notably the right and the elite who are dealing with this issue, actually it moved on from an ethnic rhetoric into a religious one. So because Abdenur, earlier... If, if I may, because, you know, in the, the previous uh, Islamophobic incident that took place, we had, the, in fact, the interior minister, Darmanin, who had come out and, in fact, um, you know, he had condemned that incident. But at the very same time, it's been the interior minister who has been uh, the most Islamophobic, in fact, in his statement. So how does France then justify that? Is this then essentially as what we've come to understand that France wants its own version of Islam? So it's okay with mosques, in a sense, as long as they are following what France wants Muslims to do and say? Exactly. This is the key point, because, as, as, as I said, so President Macron and his uh, hardcore or hawks on, the, on this issue, notably his interior minister and his undersecretary, I mean, her name is Maria uh, <coughs> she, 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 Schiappa, she, who is in charge of citizenship, integration, and so on, and his education minister. So these three 
uh, hawkish in this in his government who are trying to domesticate Islam. It's very interesting when you said, like was last week, when the the, the mosque was attacked and was tagged with. Uh, hatred uh, signs, etc., toward the Muslims. And, I mean, immediately the interior minister showed up and he showed his full support for the Muslims. For, but what they are calling here, they are calling for kind of soft Islam, which is, I don't know what does this mean. And also, I think the followers and the analysts who have been working on this issue, their main issue is dealing with the so-called political Islam slash Islamists. But on the other hand, it's, they are getting, getting this totally wrong because they are dealing with this, I mean, as if it's causing it's a national threat, a national security issue yeah. to, 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 Fran to France. But on the other hand, they are not, let's say, t t t t taking seriously the, the issue of how they deal with the, uh, immigration. But it's two, I mean, Islam and immigration are two different uh, questions because Indeed. the the Muslims who have been here for so long, they are expecting their children today are well integrated. If to some point or to some extent, as the right and the far right uh, elite and uh, elite uh, politicians okay. like assimilation, they are well right. assimilated. Uh, the North to leave it there at that, but of course, uh, we as always appreciate you taking our time out uh, this Saturday to, to speak with us and to share your expertise with us. That was Abdel Nour Toumi speaking to us there from the French capital, Paris. We were discussing there the latest Islamophobic attack against a mosque in France, uh, this time in the city of Bordeaux. Again, not a surprise, um, uh, something that I mentioned in my introduction as well, cause and effect. Um, if the French government, if, if the even interior minister does condemn this attack, that in and of itself doesn't absolve them of their responsibility through their hateful rhetoric and through the policies that they have brought in ever since um, their effort to win re-election um, has come about because, again, they feel that the entire society is moving in a more right-wing, Islamophobic direction, seemingly, and that is where uh, winning votes lies. I'll be back with our next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Will Carvis. In this segment, we're going to continue to discuss Iran-Israel tensions. We've had this tit-for-tat shadow war between both sides playing out. Um, and now there is concern about the fact that Iran has enriched uranium to a 60% purity. Um, what does this mean for both sides at this point in time? Because, of course, we also know that Israel has a more secret nuclear uh, weapons program of its own. The Iranians say that their program is, of course, only for nuclear energy. Um, nevertheless, it's seems the tensions between the two sides are seemingly escalating, especially, of course, since the Americans want to re-enter the nuclear deal. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're now joined by Laura Rockwood, who is uh, the director of the Open Nuclear Network. She's joining us today from Vienna. And joining us from Rome is Dr. Giuliano Bifolci, who is the director of ASRI Analytica. Giuliano and Laura, good afternoon to you both, and thank you both for joining us. Uh, Laura, let me start with you, if I may. Um, what exactly do you think is going to happen when it comes to the nuclear deal itself, considering we've now had um, the seemingly this is a shadow war between both sides, i.e. the Israelis and the Iranians happening, which could very much muddy the waters, couldn't it? It certainly made it more challenging, but uh, you see the announcements that they're all coming back here to Vienna uh, in the course of next week to resume the discussions, and I consider that a very positive uh, development. The, it, the Israelis haven't managed to derail the discussions, and neither have the hardliners either in the United States or in Iran been able to derail it. I believe the presidents, the uh, presidential administrations in both countries are committed to trying to find a peaceful solution to this through dialogue. Giuliano, what are your thoughts about this? Um in the context of the Europeans, right? Because we keep talking about the Israelis, the Americans, and, and their goals vis-a-vis -vis this nuclear deal. But the fact is that the Europeans have remained part of this deal, um, even when Donald Trump walked away from it. What do you think that they're thinking at this point in time about this entire issue, about this shadow war between the Israelis and the Iranians? 
first of all, thanks for this invitation. And let's say that the Europeans will support completely the deal and also we welcome if Iran and the United States will agree again on the, on the nuclear deal. And uh, for the first time, probably the European Union um, will not support anymore uh, Israel. And because uh, according to in the European Union strategy, also economic strategy, uh, Iran uh, will be an important asset. So, and they are uh, monitoring for sure in Europe, we are monitoring what is happening uh, in the Middle East and what is happening between Israel and Iran. And looking at Iran as a possible uh, trade commercial partner, especially in the energy field. So, for I believe that European Union and European countries will support and will give their, they will agree with the United States and Iran for the deal. Hmm. Or, uh, you know, uh, as somebody who has who has been part of the IAEA in the past yourself, I wonder um, when we're talking about sixty percent purity, right, uh, enrichment right now. Um, from what I've understood, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that this is still very much a reversible step. Um, however, it is significant, is it not? I mean, it's not it's not one to be overlooked easily. What does it signify overall? What message is Iran sending out? Well, first of all, it is significant because once you get up over 20%, it is much easier to uh, to get to 90%, which is what is generally accepted as weapons usable uh, enriched uranium. It is significant. I think the Iranians are trying to send the message that you shouldn't push us too hard. Uh, I think it's really unfortunate, but I understand the rate of production of the 60% is fairly low, and it is relatively easy to roll back the enrichment level. You can also down blend it. So it is definitely reversible. And Rouhani, President Rouhani has already made that clear that they're willing to do that under certain circumstances. I would certainly encourage them to do so because 60% makes everybody nervous. Um, Giuliano, the, the goal, I would think, on the Israeli part was probably to, to discourage the Iranians um, in that attack on Natanz uh, from continuing with their, their nuclear program, but it seems to have had the opposite effect. I mean, that in and of itself could be dangerous, right, where it seems like this uh, could be seen as a provocation by the Iranians and then pushes them further into enriching uranium to a higher and higher purity. That's a sort of like counterproductive, in fact, isn't it? Yes, I can completely agree with you. In fact, in the last year, Israel security forces and intelligence agencies and secret services have conducted several uh, uh, secret operations against Iran, uh, Iranian office officers, also Iranian infrastructures. And all these actions are pushing Iran uh, closer to the agreement. And so, so what Israel has done is like uh, creating like fertile ground for the agreement. If we think that, uh, to the, in the past, in the past, like Iran was uh, far, uh, particularly under uh, Trump administration, but now there is a new opportunity, and Iran has also understood, first of all, that there is a breach uh, in its security uh, department, security field, uh, uh, cannot protect uh, anymore uh, its uh, infrastructures. Uh, secondly, it needs to uh, to reach another deal to improve its economic situation because the sanctions are eating the country. And third, uh, with the nuclear deal, with the new deal, Israel cannot anymore to conduct the is a secret operations against Iran. Um, Laura, at this point in time, if if this sort of is ready activities are sort of produce, you know, proving counterproductive, in fact, and are pushing the Iranians um, ever more into enriching uranium. I mean, do you think that there are probably conversations happening behind the scenes telling the Israelis, listen, you need to stop, especially probably on the part of the Europeans? Oh, I would be surprised if there weren't. I mean, that's simply the way these things work. Uh, I, I personally agree. I think these uh, actions have been counterproductive um, if you want peaceful resolution. It's played definitely into the hands of the IRGC, the, uh, um, the, the military faction that wants to see this JCPOA fall apart. Um, so I would be extremely surprised if there weren't quiet conversations being held uh, in the background. 
But at the same time, Laura, then one wonders how much leverage really do the Europeans have over the Israelis over this issue, because for the Israelis, in their own words, this is an issue of national security. Um, on the part of the Iranians, they're like, listen, we have a deal with the rest of the world, as in with, with the major world powers, and you're not even a party to that. You're not even, in fact, a party to the NPT, i.e. the Israelis. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think the real players here, it's the, it's the U.S.-Israeli relationship. I think the Europeans can add their voice and their weight to it, but the real conversation is between uh, Netanyahu and uh, and Biden, or both of their people. Uh, that's really where the conversation has to take place. It's been great to see the Europeans back the negotiation of the deal and acting as the mediators here. But the real voices are uh, are are in Washington. Hmm. Giuliano. Um when we had the Europeans just remaining in the deal after Donald Trump had walked away, you know, there was a number of efforts on the part of Europe to save the deal, right? So we had Instex and we had a number of other such efforts as well. But all of the above were seen as unsatisfactory by the Iranians. So um, is it as, as Laura alluded to as well? I mean, when it comes to the Israelis, that it's actually really the Americans who have really the power here to make or break this situation. Um, and if so, which way will this possibly go, in your opinion? Well, uh, for sure, uh, all these uh, issues is about Israeli-U.S. relations. And Israel should understand that uh, Joe Biden administration has a different foreign policy in the Middle East and, and wants to achieve this deal as did the, the past uh, Barack Obama administration. And now it is it's important to understand if Israel would like to like decrease or stop its good allied and friendship with alliance and friendship with uh, the United States. And I believe it's hard to hard to believe because it's quite impossible because the, the connection between not only the two countries in economic way, but also in the security ways is really strong. And other ways, uh, the United States, they know that uh, if they don't reach again the deal, they push Iran in the arms of the Russians, the Chinese, if you think the recent agreement between Iran and China, and also if you think the increasing cooperation between Russia and Iran. So the United States needs to reach the deal, and for this time, probably Israel should accept that uh, the United States foreign policy is more important than Israeli foreign policy. Hmm. Uh, do you get the, the feeling, because there's a lot of people who have spoken, and this has happened many, many times in the past, right, that um, Israel and, and Iran are on the verge of war. I mean, that seems like an overstatement, certainly, because I would think neither side actually wants a war. But do you think this is important enough an issue for the Israelis that they would push for some sort of a, more of a, you know, confrontation on it if, um, you know, the talks, for example, in Vienna progress even further? Uh, no, I think ultimately you're right that neither side really wants uh, an altercation. Um, I think it is not in either side's uh, security interest to do that. So um, I, I don't think, I don't see the Israelis becoming so aggressive if there is a deal, because ultimately if it is possible for the Iranians and the Americans to conclude a deal whereby Iran uh, draws back its nuclear program, I think that will ultimately be perceived in Israel's interest. Now, it's really hard to know because you have hardliners in all three of these countries, countries who would rather see conflict escalate rather than de-escalate. But generally speaking, um, I, I would be willing to bet you that the Israeli military, like the U.S. military, and probably like most of the Iranian military outside of the IRGC, uh, understand the costs of that kind of a conflagration, just simply unsurvivable. Okay, okay. final word, Giuliano, before letting um, both of you go. On the issue specifically just of the Israeli nuclear weapons program. You know, the Iranians from day one, as you know very well as well, have had that as a complaint, the fact that there is no international oversight into Israel's nuclear weapons program. Um, is there, do you think, any chance of there being movement on the international communities in that regard? Because I would think that that would also um, help calm the situation, and I'm saying on the, on the part of the Iranians, that is. So, um, I don't 
I don't believe that uh, after all these complaints that Israel will uh, deem, like will give more access to information regarding its nuclear weapons program, and because also uh, it was part of the deterrence against Iran, against also other uh, enemies or uh, uh, key actors in the regions. So they will, this will be probably like. Uh, in, uh, a mistake because uh, in the future it will be easier for enemies not only for Iran but other competitors to know more about uh, this uh, nuclear weapon program and how to counteract against it. I believe that uh, on the uh, on this case probably Israel uh, will could accept more the deal uh, without giving more information. Very well. We'll leave there as a final word, but as always, we appreciate Giuliano joining us there from Rome and Laura uh, today for joining us from Vienna. Uh, they were both speaking there about um, the ongoing Israel-Iran tensions, and these tensions are not new, but they've become a lot worse, specifically as these Vienna talks seem to progress. The Israelis really do not want the Americans to re-enter the deal, but um, as we've discussed with our guests, it, it seems that neither side really actually wants a proper, full-on co confrontation either. So the Israelis may very well accept uh, the Americans re-entering the deal, but even that possibility is far off at this point in time, even though the rhetoric seemingly is fairly positive. Uh, can the Iranians get full sanctions? being lifted. I mean, all of those are very heavy-duty issues, which I would think that the Biden administration will have a very hard time coming to terms with. Nevertheless, uh, the Israelis have their own concerns, and the Iranians have their own concerns about Israeli activities as well. So it's, it's on both sides. And um, as both of our guests there have, have expressed, we hope that both sides can have cooler heads prevail uh, so that there isn't, in fact, a worsening um, of stability in the region as well. I'll be back with my final segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Okara Vizvi. Now, in this segment, we're going to discuss uh, anti-Asian American hate crimes, which have been taking place in the context of the ongoing pandemic in the United States. But, of course, also around the world, we've had Asians come under uh, hate crimes in parts of Europe as well as Australia and otherwise in Canada as well. Um, nevertheless, the United States Senate has now overwhelmingly passed a bill to combat the rise, in fact, again, of hate crimes against Asian community uh, during the pandemic. Um, Essentially, what this bill does, from what I've understood, is that it will make it easier to record such crimes altogether and to make it a lot clearer uh, as to the kinds of hate crimes that these communities are facing as a whole, something that has been missing, from what I've understood in the past in the U.S., uh, at least in this very organized fashion. And, of course, there are a whole, sto whole host of other measures which uh, the bill will be taken to ensure that such hate crimes uh, are lessened and that there are proper accountability and justice carried out as well in that regard. Uh, let's discuss all of that a bit further. And I'm joined by Joseph Fleming, who is the director at Strafe Risk Management. He's joining us this morning from Houston, Texas. Joining us from Hartford, Connecticut is Dr. Johnny Eric Williams, who is a professor of sociology at Trinity College. Johnny and Joseph, thank you both for joining us this morning. Joseph, let me start with you. Uh, how important is this bill at this time? Um, there was a significant amount of hate crimes that we've seen just over the past few months as well. Um, will this be the measure that will hopefully stem that flow of hate crimes? Well, I think it certainly brings more attention to the issue. Um, whether it solves things or not, you know, I think that's hard to see at this point. Uh, I think probably one of the more critical pieces of the bill, um, again, is bringing attention to the issue and, and providing some, um, some training for local law enforcement to be able to uh, prosecute these, these types of crimes more effectively. You know, I think you know, beyond this bill, it's part of a bigger conversation in the U.S. that, um, you know, it, it's important to be careful of our political rhetoric and blaming China for COVID and these types of things that, you know, there, there are unintended consequences sometimes. And that affects the uh, communities in the U.S., like the Asian community, that are major contributors to the U.S. economy and, and the U.S. Uh, cultural system. Exactly. This, this does come down to rhetoric, right? And of course, um, the easiest person to pick on when it comes to this is, is Donald Trump. Um, but there have been others as well who have not helped along the way vis-a-vis -vis their rhetoric during the pandemic. How important uh, is that aspect? 
I get very concerned about uh, anything that's dealing with rhetoric, right? This is a, the title of the bill itself is the COVID-19 uh, Hate Crime Act. Uh, so it means that this is related to uh, just the kinds of crimes, that is crimes that are racially motivated against Asian Americans, right? Uh, it's motivated against them in this particular moment, right? And that it's an issue really, and I think this guy, Josh Hawley, uh, this Senator from Missouri, who's pretty much a white supremacist. But I, but I gotta say, I agree with him somewhat because this it, it, it's an attempt to regulate uh, speech in, in a way, right? Uh, so it's really not getting at the, the issue of a crime, but regulation of speech. Because these, what's really going on, it seems to me in the bill, is, is that they're, they're actually uh, trying to, like you said, uh, uh, account for what is actually a hate crime, what is actually a hate incident. Uh, hate incidents are very broadly defined and not criminal. You can't put people in jail for just looking at you wrong or walking the other way when you approach them, uh, shunning you and stuff like that. So the bill may be, in a, uh, may be doing a bit too much, but the reporting, yes, is very good. I, I think we should have some a metric for understanding what's going on when it comes to a, a crimes in, uh, against Asian Americans. But these hate incidents, though, we got to parse that out uh, because it becomes very problematic. Bonnie, as, as a sociologist yourself, you know, what exactly uh, and how exactly do you view this, this sort of reaction, right, within the pandemic context that, you know, that instead of, in fact, bringing people together, this is, in fact, divided people? Well, well, well uh, there are several things going on, right? Geopolitically, uh, China is a rising power. And so Donald Trump, the previous president, uh, viewed, viewed uh, this demonization of China uh, with the pandemic as an opportunity to further uh, stoke uh, American passions for uh, a war with China. I mean, we're repositioning uh, 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 military all over the world around China uh, to control China because we see China as a uh, um, as a competitor, right? So when we think of uh, of saying what's going on domestically. Look, Asian Americans should be subjected uh, to uh, this kind of vitriol, uh, hatred, uh, 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 just pure, straight up white supremacy. And this stuff is all interconnected with the long history of the country itself. Uh, the country itself foundationally is a white supremacist society. And anybody who wasn't from uh, Northern Europe was seen as someone who should be suspected. Uh, who would never be fully American as outsiders and so forth. So people are buying into that stuff uh, that, that has a long trajectory uh, and it hasn't stopped. So what can we do? Uh, basically, uh, bills like this, I think, uh, if they were constructed more carefully and not to, to erode uh, American civil liberties, uh, would be good. But it's just not legislation alone. There has to be a fundamental restructuring of, of American culture and institutions uh, to stop this stuff from going on. So then that goes to the heart of the matter, doesn't it, Joseph, for, for many, many people, that it's not just about the pandemic. It's not just about these specific set, the specific set, I should say, of anti-Asian hate crimes that have taken place recently. But in fact, that this is um, going back to the whole conversation that the United States and in fact, many European countries too are having about white supremacy, far right extremism, all of the above. Um, do you see that the, the country is being able to, will be able to deal with that issue uh, properly? I mean, sure. I, I think here people have a lot of different opinions across the spectrum about what, what the root causes are of these types of issues. But I think there's a certainly a genu uh, general consensus that, you know, there are issues. And I think generally the U.S., you know, at least what we pride ourselves on is we don't always get everything right, but there's a movement towards the positive in the long term. Um, you know, if we can, and it seems there is consensus, but, you know, good, seeing people, seeing, you know, the numbers that passed this bill in Congress, some consensus to, 
you know, understand these issues and and help uh, help the American people understand that, you know, whether it's whether it's Hispanics or Blacks or Asian Americans, you know, these are you know we're we're a multicultural country. These are important parts of our society. And I think as long as we continue seeing these issues and moving in a positive direction, that's that's the best you can hope for. And I think it sets, you know, again, that's that's always the example. You know, ideologically, we 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 try to set show the rest of the world that you know we understand we have problems, but we generally try to move in a positive direction with these types of issues. Johnny, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, we've just had, for example, the Floyd verdict uh, coming out where Derek Chauvin's also been found guilty. Um, that, for, for many people, at least on the outside, was, was important to see um, that, you know, that, you know, there can be justice in such cases as well. Um, is America moving in the right trajectory right now? No, <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree with the uh, with Joseph on that. Uh, the United States, uh, just with this bill, uh, they have broadly defined uh, uh, what is uh, a hate crime. It's just not directed at Asians. It's, it, it includes any race. So you can you can be a director of hate crime and be subjected to saying anti-white stuff too, right? And believe me, that stuff will be turned around and used on the very people it's supposed to help because of, of the prevalence of white supremacists in the United States, everyday white supremacists uh, in suits, uh, are just your neighbors and so forth, right? And they'll say that you will be, you're being anti-white. So it, it seems like every time the country make, a, make a, a step forward, it takes about two steps back, or uh, maybe even three, you know? Uh, so, so no, I don't see it that way. Our history dictates, the historical record dictates that the United States has doubled down rather than trying to move forward. Uh, every time black folks make an advance, like with the election uh, in the United States, the presidential election, what happens? Uh, if black folks show up, uh, uh, um, a Latino show up, an Asian show up, well, they're gonna now suppress the vote, right? So these are not positive steps. These are steps continuing down the tradition of oppressing people around the world and at home. Uh, Joseph, I'll give you the final word before I let both of you go. Um, uh, what should do you think happen next when it comes to dealing with this specific again set of anti-Asian hate crimes? Because we've had, of course, the change of a president in the U.S. President Biden has been, of course, um, understanding of the fact that there have been hate crimes increase because of rhetoric and because of a whole host of probably other reasons as well. Um, but what are the next steps? Because I would think that this is a path, right? There, there needs to be other steps taken for there to be proper than cohesion in society. Well, you know, I, I think really what it comes down to is seeing that these discussions are happening, seeing these conversations are happening, e even if there's disagreement, even if there's controversy, it's a step in the right direction. It's showing that, you know, these issues are at the forefront. It's showing that these issues are being talked about, whereas previously they may not have been. They may have just been under the radar and happening and no one thought it was controversial. You know, I think... You know, whether it's, uh, you know, the Chauvin trial here or Asian hate crimes or different things like that, you know, the fact that people are talking about it is probably the most important thing. You know, uh, the, the best thing you can do is expose these 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 issues. And I think, you know, the Biden administration is doing a, a, a good job in a lot of ways, you know, in these areas, you know, bringing it to the forefront. And showing, you know, uh, you know, with their with their appointments with the administration, a number of Asian Americans throughout a, a diverse spectrum, not not, you know, just kind of the uh, East Asians, uh, but South Asians and, and others as well, and other minorities as well. I think uh, I, I think all you can all you can hope for is that the con the conversations continue, and you convince more and more people, and you trend in a positive direction over the long term. We'll leave it there at that, but we really appreciate both Joseph and Johnny for taking their time out this morning to speak to us respectively from Houston and Hartford, we're discussing there the anti-Asian um, hate crime bill that has been passed. And it's not just specifically, of course, about Asians, as Johnny there correctly pointed out. It does have to do with recording hate crimes more specifically, um, defining hate crimes more clearly as well for police, uh, um, police around the country so that statistics come out in a more specific fashion about which communities have been affected and 
what incidents have affected which communities as well. Um, all those are extremely important. And then hopefully dealing with this issue, dealing with the rhetoric that has come out, also in the context of the pandemic, is an extremely important aspect also. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Okar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.